Good morning. <clears throat> My name is John, and I will be with you this morning as we look at the Word of God. We're going through this series on a few of Jesus' parables together, and last week, oh, actually, before I start, sorry, uh, if you'd like the outline in Chinese or Thai, please feel free to uh, pick up these QR codes. Uh, get out of the way here. Uh, I have to admit that I go from an outline, so I ad lib quite a bit, so I apologize for that ahead of time. But hopefully the, the outline will give you something of a hook to, to hang what I'm talking about on. Uh, last week, we were in Matthew chapter 13, looking at the parable of the sower, or sometimes called the parable of the four soils. And this week, we're going to stay in Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to look at the very next parable in the chapter, sometimes called the parable of the wheat and the tares, sometimes called the parable of tares among wheat. So while you're turning to Matthew chapter 13, just a couple broad uh, thoughts on the parables. The parables are stories that utilize elements from everyday life for the audience. So events or things that people are familiar with. And the, the stories are built to convey a truth. But like anything illustrative, the, the parables have a degree of subjectivity. So the parables ultimately invite questions. And we see in throughout Matthew chapter 13 that Jesus is willing to respond to these questions. So if we look at verses 18 through 23, Jesus gives an explanation of the parable that we looked at last week. Uh, if we look down at verses 36 through 43, which we're going to look at this morning, again, Jesus gives an explanation of, of the parable. Uh, both of these seem to be in response to the disciples coming to him and asking questions. And then towards the end of the chapter in verses 49 and 50, Jesus volunteers an explanation of the parable of the dragnet. So I encourage you that as we go through the parables, not just this week, but uh, throughout the weeks that we're looking at this, as questions come up for you, approach Jesus with those questions. He doesn't turn away the one that comes with an earnest heart asking questions. If we come looking for answers to build our own ambitions, to build our own desires, we might not get answers, or we might get answers that we didn't really want, but the one that comes to him with the earnest heart, with the honest question, he never turns away. So let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we just ask that your spirit this morning would illumine our hearts, would illumine our minds, would open our eyes, would open our ears to what it is that you desire to say to us. We know that you are working on each one of us individually. We know that we each have areas that you desire to grow and to develop. So most of all, we just desire that we would approach this this morning with soft hearts, with responsive hearts, that we are prepared to say yes to you in those areas that you want to work on for us personally and as as a corporate audience. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the parable we're going to look at is found in verses 24 through 30. Thank you. Somebody's keeping up with it that I'm not. Uh, so in verses 24 through 30, as we go through, uh, I have a number of scripture references on the slides, but 
if you would like to do sword drills, you are more than welcome to try to catch all of these uh, uh, verse references. But you don't have to. We're going to camp out in Matthew chapter 13. But I strongly encourage that if you can, take note of the references that are on the screen. And as you have time later on, go to these references on your own and think about how these feed into or offer insight into the passage that we're looking at here in Matthew 13. So in verses 24 through 30, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares or weeds? And the landowner said to them, an enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. So verses 24 through 26 there. We see in the parable a man sowing good seed. And in verse 26, we see that seed defined as wheat. Uh, in verse 25, we see that an enemy comes and sows tares or weeds. But then again, looking at verse 26, verse 26 says that when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, the tares became evident also. So the implication here is that before the grain bursts on the wheat, the plants don't really look any different. So it's quite likely that these weeds that were sown in the field are something like a plant called darden. Uh, darden is virtually identical to wheat until the grain or the head of the plant bursts. The only difference between the green of the plant of darden and the green of wheat is a tiny difference in the width of the blade of the leaf. So while the, while the field is in leaf, if you were to look out over the field, it would be virtually impossible to tell that you're not looking at just a gigantic field of wheat. But the heads of wheat and the head of darden is quite clearly different. So again, in verse 26, we see that when the wheat bears grain, the tares now become obvious. But the, land, the servants of the landowner, when they, learn, when they learn this, they look at the landowner and they say, well, do you want us to go weed the wheat field? They want to be good servants. They want to go clean up the wheat field. But by the time the head bursts on the wheat, what you can see above ground in all likelihood, what you, what you can't see under the surface is that all of the roots of these plants are entwined and tangled up and mixed up. So the landowner, being a wise farmer, says, no, we're not going to do that because in your efforts to pull weeds, in all likelihood, when you yank up a weed, you're probably going to pull all of the good stuff that surrounds that weed up with it. So we're going to wait and we're gonna wait until the harvest because at the time of the harvest, it doesn't matter whether or not you pull up the wheat because we're harvesting it anyway. And we're gonna go through the painstaking process of separating the bad stuff and bundling it up to send it off for destruction. And the good stuff is going to be gathered into my barn for storage. 
So in verses 36 through 43, Jesus offers an explanation of at least some of what it is that he's illustrating with this parable. So in verse 36, Jesus had been speaking to the crowds that he had been speaking to when we saw him last week. Uh, but here in verse 36, he goes into a house seemingly with just the small audience of those who are close followers of him. And these followers come and ask him to explain this parable. So, in response to the request, Jesus gives us some specific one-to-one -one relationships as to what elements of this parable represent. So take a second to look at these uh, specific things that he says. This is in verses 37 through 39. So based on the specific things that Jesus gives in his explanation, this on the screen is the parable with these things overlaid. So take a minute to read over the parallel with what Jesus specifically tells his disciples. And as you're reading, you'll, you should notice some things that are left not specifically explained. So Jesus doesn't give us everything in the parable. He doesn't tell us who the men who slept were. He doesn't specifically tell us who the landowner is. He doesn't tell us who the slaves are. So there's some subjectivity that's left in what he delivers. What I highlighted in blue at the bottom is the primary point that Jesus brings out out of this parable. In verses 40 through 43, Jesus draws a very strong parallel to verse 30. And he tells us that just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So thinking about the main point that Jesus brings out in the parable, what can we take away from this? To begin with, I think that we can take away a couple of thoughts from the wheat field. Actually, I'm gonna leave this up for a moment. So you can either follow along in your Bible or you can follow along uh, with what's written up on the screen. But verses 24 through 26 again, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, the tares became evident also. Just as the tares, when they're green, are not immediately obvious in a field of green wheat, good and evil 
are not always clearly discerned. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the account of the fall of man. We see the account of the breaking of the world. And in verse 6, we see Adam and Eve standing before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil after listening to the serpent. Verse 6 says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Wrong choices can have lasting consequences. But as they stand in front of this tree, it looks right. So to their ability, they look at this tree and the tree looks like the fruit is healthy. The tree looks like the fruit is good for them. The tree itself is appealing to look at. It's attractive to their eyes. And the tree seems to be beneficial based on what they've been told by the serpent for giving wisdom. Wisdom's a good thing, right? We need wisdom to make decisions in our life. James in his first chapter warns that each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Twice in the Proverbs, we're told that there's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Thinking about this account in Genesis chapter 3, we know that God has specifically told Adam you are not to take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will die. So as Adam and Eve stand before this tree, they're faced with a choice. They can choose to evaluate this decision in front of them through their own limited human perspective that's telling them one thing, or they can choose to evaluate this decision in front of them through the eyes of the one that made everything around them. As I was prepping for this morning, I got an email that had a very applicable quote uh, for the message this morning. The pastor Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said that discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. So in most cases, we probably don't hear an audible voice of God speaking with us as Adam did in the garden. So how do we face these choices? We've been left the 66 books of the Bible for our efforts. How well do we understand our Bible and how our Bible relates to our lives? This can be kind of intimidating. This is a big book. Uh, the book was written in languages that are very unfamiliar to most of us. Uh, the book talks about events and people that lived two, three, four, five thousand years ago or more. So very little relevance to our lives. The cultures in the book are quite strange. But as big, as, as big and strange as the book is, if you take the total number of chapters in both the Old and New Testaments combined and divide them over the course of 365 or 366 days, 
You can read the entire Bible from the first chapter of Genesis to the last chapter of Revelation by only reading about three and a quarter chapters a day. So if you were to choose to spread that over a year and a half or two years, you could read the Bible from cover to cover in a chapter and a half to just over two chapters a day. And as you read, spend time jotting down questions and thoughts that occur to you as you go through the passage and think about how maybe this is not so dissimilar to the things that are going on in, in my life today. For some people, that's a little unstructured. That's a little, uh, that's a little difficult because it doesn't give me a whole lot of direction. There are a number of groups that put out materials that you can get that will encourage you to read sections of the, of the scriptures and ask simple who, what, when, where, and why kind of questions. Who wrote this thing? Who's listening to this as it's first delivered? What's going on in the background as this text was delivered to the audience? Why is, this, uh, why is this here at the time that it was written? And then take the answers to those questions and think about how does that apply to me today? We need to grow in our ability to evaluate our world through biblical eyes. So how are we doing with our understanding of our Bible? And what's your plan in 2024 to increase your understanding of the Bible? There, there are lots of people in the room today that would be quite happy to sit down and talk about ideas of what you might do to learn a little bit more about the book and how it relates to you. So that's the first thought that I think that we can take from the wheat field. Second thought I think we can take from the wheat field is from verses 27 through 29. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And the landowner said to them, an enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. The first phrase of verse 30, allow both to grow together until the harvest. So some, some of the subjectivity here, in verse 27, the slaves of the landowner say, did you not sow good seed? So it certainly seems reasonable to suspect that even though the identification changes, the landowner is the man who, saw, who sowed the good seed. In which case, the landowner is the son of man. In which case, the slaves of the landowner are the servants of the Son of Man. So in verses 27 through 29, what's the responsibility of the servants of the Son of Man? They want to be good servants. They want to go out into the wheat field and clean up the wheat field immediately. But the landowner, being wise, says, you're going to wreck the good stuff because as you try to pull up the bad stuff, the good stuff is going to come up with it. So we're not going to do that now. Well, if it's not the servant's responsibility to go out and weed the garden, what's the responsibility of the servants? What does the farmer do between planting and harvest. Is weeding the garden the only thing that the farmer does between planting and harvest? Obviously not. The farmer makes sure that there's enough water on the crop so that the crop doesn't dry up. 
The farmer makes sure that the soil that the crop is growing in has enough nutrient, throwing out uh, fertilizer from time to time as necessary. The farmer guards the crop from critters that like to come in and eat green stuff, from critters that like to come in and eat seeds, from insects that uh, come in and uh, damage the crop. The farmer nurtures the crop from planting to harvest. So how does that have any relevance to us? Paul, in his first letter to the church at Corinth, in chapter 2, writes, To us, God revealed the things of God through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But to a natural man... But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." When we're redeemed by the Lord, we're given the spirit of the Lord to live within our hearts. But when we first receive the spirit of the Lord, we're like infants. We're like babies that have just come into the world, helpless, ignorant. Uh, the first time in my Christian walk that I walked into a Sunday school class, I felt like there were all kinds of eyes on me because I looked like a young professional. And I felt like everybody was looking at me like I knew what was going on. I couldn't have told you the difference between Genesis and Revelation. When we first become Christians, we're infants. The response, one of the, res well, the overall responsibility of the servants of the Son of Man is to help each other mutually grow in our spiritual connection to the Lord. In Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4, the apostles give us a number of gifts that are given with the Spirit. And the purpose of these gifts is not for our everyday lives. Each one of us have particular skills or bents or interests. Some of us are good with numbers. We can do things with math, finance, and what have you. Some of us are good with our hands. We can fix things. We can build things. Some of us are good with design. We can recognize space in very creative ways. We can recognize how certain colors and patterns go together in appealing ways. That's not what these gifts are about. This is a list of the gifts that the apostles talk about in this passage. And from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, these gifts are for the purpose of combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual, word, with spiritual words, delivering them to spiritual people that we might grow in that spiritual connection to the Lord. So take a look at this list for a few minutes. 
and see if anything in here grabs your attention that maybe might relate to you. Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Everyone who has the Spirit of God has at least one thing on this list. Some people have a number of things on this list. Two other parables that Jesus gives us are the parable of the talents and the parable of the minas. The parable of the talents is in Matthew 25 and the parable of the minas is in Luke 19. In both of these parables, we have a master or a Lord who goes off on a journey or he goes off to receive authority and he leaves his affairs in the hands of his servants. He gives one of his servants 10 talents or 10 minas, another five and another one. The, the talents and the minas in the parable are denominations of money basically. The master determined who got what and not everybody got the same thing. Everyone indwelt by the Spirit of God has at least one gift. Some have many. But just as when we come out of the, just when we come into the kingdom and receive the Spirit of God, these gifts don't come to us fully grown and fully developed. So how are you developing your spiritual gifts? Same two parables. The Lord, returns, the Lord returns to his estate and settles accounts with his servants. The servant that receives the 10 and the servant that receives the five come to the master and they give him back the 10, they give him back the five. But in addition, the one who'd received the 10 gives him 10 more and the one who'd received the five gives him five more. And the master praises them highly for building on and developing what it is that he had given them. But the one who had received the one comes to the master and tells him, I'm afraid of you because I know that you expect things that you don't do anything for. So I was afraid I was going to lose this thing. So I buried it so I wouldn't lose it. So here's the one that you gave me back. Here's the one that you gave to me back. And the master is furious. He calls him a wicked and lazy servant and says, if you knew that I expected these things, why didn't you at least put it in the bank so that it would earn interest so that you could give me interest on my return? What are you doing to develop your spiritual gifts? And where the rubber meets the road, how are you applying your spiritual gift or gifts? These gifts are not, give, are not granted to us, given to us, for our own individual benefit. They benefit us, no doubt. These gifts help us to grow. But these gifts are given to us to be shared among all of those in the family of God. So what are you doing to apply or to use those gifts that have been given? Just as kind of an illustration, uh, within, within the first 12 to 24 months of my Christian walk, I was challenged to make it a discipline to read the Bible through at a minimum once every two years, best every year. So. I decided that I would take that challenge and I began to do that. Around about the same time, I was introduced to a very young church, a church that was uh, just getting started, so they didn't have their own building. They met in a high school. And pretty quickly, I recognized that in order for this church to happen, somebody had to be coming in in the morning and setting everything up. And then somebody had to take everything down when it was over. So I thought, well, you know, I can do that. I don't know anything about the Bible, but I can pick up a chair and throw a chair around. So I found out uh, when they met and what they did, and I began to help set up and take down the, the uh, church every Sunday. 
when the church did get their own property, it was quite a large church, and uh, they had a big parking lot that was hard to navigate. So they needed people to help uh, direct traffic around the parking lot so that people didn't get furious with each other trying to get in and out. So I helped with the team that was directing traffic in the, in the parking lot. As time went on, uh, I was asked to teach a Sunday school class, a, uh, uh, a small group setting. So as I did that, I began to learn how to use concordances, Bible dictionaries, commentaries, and the like to get a broader feel for whatever it was that I was teaching, and I began to teach those things. And gradually over time, I was invited to uh, teach in other settings. A progressive thing. So how are you developing and using the gifts that you've been given? We need to evaluate our world through biblical eyes. We need to be attending to the responsibilities of the servants of the Son of Man because the end of the age is coming. Allow both to grow together until the time of the harvest. In the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. This is not a maybe thing. There are, there are at least a couple of religions in the world that don't believe anything about a fixed origin or a fixed ending. To, to a large extent, evolution, although it's not a formal religion, also holds to this kind of thought. But these, the, these systems believe that everything is just this great big cycle. Nothing started the cycle, everything just is. And it just goes through this big cycle infinitely. That's not what the Bible teaches. In the very first verse of Genesis, the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, a fixed point of origin. In Acts chapter 17, we find Paul in Athens speaking in the auditorium on Mars Hill or the Oropagus. And Paul says that the Lord has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. The Lord has fixed a day where he will judge the world in righteousness through Jesus, whom he has already proven through Jesus' resurrection from the dead. We have no idea when this day is going to happen. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, of this day, no, of this day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, Jesus doesn't even know, but the Father alone. But we know it's coming, and in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus tells the disciples of major events that are going to be taking, a, taking place all over the globe. And he tells them, learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. When we look at a tree and see a tree begin to put out its leaves, we know that summer is right around the corner. And Jesus says, so you too, when you see all these things that I just talked about, recognize that the Lord is near, right at the door. The why of why we need to be evaluating our world through, through biblical eyes and attending to the responsibilities of the servant is because the harvest is coming. Do you ever stop and think about that? Do you ever think about the reality that the harvest is coming? And when you do, what's the response of your heart to that thought? The Apostle Peter in his second letter, 
in chapter 3, he says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? The worship team is going to come up and lead us in one more song. So as they're coming back up, thinking about the coming harvest, we want to set our hearts to learn to evaluate our world through how it appears in the scriptures. We want to be seeking to help one another grow in maturity in our relationships to the Lord. And we want to seek to help one another grow in maturity in our lives with Christ. We want to seek to be living as reflections of Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your voice to each one of our hearts individually. We know that you desire to grow each one of us to fit into the plan that you have for your world. And we just desire this morning that we would be responsive to what it is that you have for us. So we just ask that you would open our eyes this morning that as we go out, we might see you in a new way. And we might be able to, to uh, uh, grow in these things and share with those around us in a new way. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.